Born 1956 in a rugged mountainous region of North Africa, a curly-haired Joseph Bobot had no idea of the life that lay ahead of him. Morocco's rich history and its hidden countryside made it the perfect place for kids to explore. Joe's parents were Jewish, and although he didn't realize it yet, his family would soon be under great danger. The Six-Day War was brewing, and unlike other 10-year-olds, Joe wasn't able to play outside. Instead, he was helping his family frantically pack up their belongings. Egypt and Syria were at war with Israel, and before it spilled into Morocco, they needed to leave. So in 1967, Joe and his parents fled Morocco and moved to France. Life in Paris was exciting, but it was also tough on Joe. Unlike the friends he had in Morocco, the kids he met in Paris didn't really like him. Being an outsider of Jewish descent, Joe felt bullied and discriminated against, even in school. But despite it all, he always made sure to get good grades. Without many friends, Joe became antisocial and never went to parties. As he grew older, he became somewhat of an outcast, wandering the streets of Paris alone. His only friends were the buttered bread and coffee he had each morning. Upon completing basic education, Joe's parents encouraged him to enroll in college and study mathematics and physics, both of which were high paying jobs, but at 17 years old, he no longer wanted to live by society's standards. Plus, he had just met his girlfriend and her parents were becoming a big influence on him. After many talks with her dad, Joe finally decided to try his hand at entrepreneurship. The first thing he did was go to local swap meets and start hustling, buying and selling everything from clothes to frying pans. Little by little, Joe hustled and saved up enough money to buy his first car. At just 19 years old, he walked into one of Paris' used car dealerships and purchased his very own Mercedes-Benz. It wasn't pretty, but that didn't matter to him, because for the first time in his life, he had proved that hard work actually does pay off. Shortly after purchasing that car, Joe decided to drop out of school and up his ante in the reselling game. The first thing he did was open up his very own storefront. Specializing in buying and reselling denim, Joe was sourcing and selling Levi's, Wranglers, and Lee jeans to anyone he could. The store never made much money, but it did allow him to make a living and save up enough money to buy a ring. A few months later, at 19 years old, Joe dropped to his knee, proposed, and married his girlfriend of two years. Shortly after their wedding, they ended up having two kids together, and although Joe thought Paris was the most beautiful city in the world, he didn't really want to raise a family there. The city was far too strict for him. Ever since a kid, he had envied the freedom of the American lifestyle. He had grown up watching basketball and listening to rock and roll, both of which had a huge influence on him. Along with the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and the Beatles blaring out of his speakers, his room was always scattered with sports memorabilia. The Lou Alcindor and Jerry West posters hanging on his wall were a constant reminder of the American dream that he so badly wanted to pursue. And whenever he could afford it, Joe asked his relatives in America to send him collegiate shirts from their local colleges. If he couldn't live in America, at least he could act and dress the part. It was at this point in his life where Joe grew out his hair, got a tan, and started referring to himself as a more American name. He would no longer be called Joe Bobot. Instead, he would go by Jeff Hamilton, a name influenced by the American actor George Hamilton. But before we get into it, we gotta run it back. I'm just sitting on the TV watching couch and get toxic. I ain't boxing. I unbox me a Glock and I knocked him out. Huh? I need an ounce of that Kush. I can't go without. I keep slurring my speech. I've been smoking weed. I can't pronounce. Man, if anybody snitching, believe it's gonna get announced. But he take it or leave it. I'm sticking firm to the amount. Huh? If you seen your boy out in traffic, you must have been in route. Money, stupid, dirty, can't even put bucks in it. Throughout the next year, Jeff contemplated closing his store and returning to college, but ditched the idea altogether. His mind was elsewhere. Instead of becoming a certified public accountant, Jeff now dreamt of becoming a designer. On his walks through Paris, he started buying every fashion magazine he saw. At night, he would trace the outlines of the clothes he saw in the magazines and use them as silhouettes to draw his own designs. And as he began designing more and more, Jeff became hyper-focused on his dream of moving to the US and becoming a designer. In 1977, at 21 years old, he wanted to find out what America was really like and purchased a round-trip ticket to California. Strolling through the beautiful, sun-dipped campus of UCLA, Jeff entered the bookstore and the clothing immediately caught his eye. As he was sifting through a rack of cluttered t-shirts, he looked to his right and was enamored by a big block letterman jacket hanging on the wall. It reminded him of the jackets that he saw sports players wear on TV. Grabbing it off the hanger, Jeff immediately tried it on. Wearing it felt like he was wearing a second skin. The large embroidered patches made him feel empowered, and for just $100, Jeff purchased the jacket and headed to the airport for his return flight home. That trip to California had changed his life. 
And three years later, in 1980, at 24 years old, Jeff and his wife decided to take their biggest risk yet. Despite barely speaking English and having only $6,000 in cash, they were going to move their family to America. Although Jeff loved California, his dreams of becoming a fashion designer had taken over his life and he ultimately decided that they would move to New York, the fashion capital of the world. But it turns out New York wasn't all that he imagined it to be. Once living there, he never saw any children playing outside and he quickly realized that New York wouldn't be the best place to raise a kid. Thinking back on that amazing campus he first visited a few years ago, Jeff packed up their belongings and moved his family yet again. This time, they were headed to Los Angeles, California. After wasting money in New York and moving his family to California, Jeff's $6,000 in savings was quickly dwindling away. The first thing he did after settling down in LA was look for a job, but nothing was close to where they lived. Realizing he would need a car to get him to work, Jeff spent their last $800 on a Ford Maverick. After four months of submitting hundreds of applications, no one called him back and Jeff became worried. He had come to America to make money, support his family, and chase the American dream, but nobody wanted to hire him. In order to survive and keep his family safe, Jeff limited their budget to $1 a day. This meant that the only food they could afford were burritos from the local gas station. His kids always wanted a loaded burrito, but those were too pricey. Instead, Jeff and his family ate plain old bean and rice burritos. And as days turned to months, his outlook on life became dark and for the first time in a while, Jeff was overwhelmed. His work visa was now expired and without a green card on hand, Jeff and his family were considered illegal immigrants. Although they could have easily returned to Paris, he had made a promise to himself before leaving France that he was moving to America and never going back. He had his sights set on the American dream and was willing to do whatever it took to make that happen. One day, as Jeff was walking home from one of his many failed door-to-door -door job searches, he saw a random person who looked like he ran a business and decided to go up and talk to him. As their conversation went on, Jeff learned that this stranger worked in the fashion industry, and before going their separate ways, Jeff made sure to exchange contact information with his new friend. Still unemployed, Jeff was frantically in need of a job and started calling the guy five to six times a day, begging him for any type of work. Jeff told him about his old store in Paris, his past experience in reselling, and his dreams of working in the fashion industry. Fed up with the constant spam calls, the guy finally agreed to let Jeff in on a job. His business had just received a huge shipment of overstock jeans and they needed to get rid of them fast. If Jeff could successfully sell the pants, he would give him a commission for each sale. Reflecting on his past experience in selling jeans, Jeff knew he could get rid of them quickly and agreed to give it a shot. He had finally got his first job in America. The next day, Jeff pulled up to the guy's warehouse in his beat-up Ford Maverick ready to load his car with all of the jeans. But to his surprise, there were no pants around. Recounting his statement, the guy explained to Jeff that he hadn't actually received the shipment of jeans yet. Instead, the overstock was being held by their manufacturers. Once sold, the manufacturers would ship the jeans to each buyer themselves, which meant that Jeff wouldn't need to physically sell them. He just needed to sell them on paper. The rest would be handled by the shipping company. Jeff thought that was easy enough and he drove away from the warehouse, heading straight towards downtown. Once in the heart of LA, Jeff went to every single clothing store he could find and gave them his sales pitch. To his surprise, he quickly sold out of every single jean and drove back to the warehouse to meet his friend and collect his commission. But to his disappointment, Jeff wasn't able to get paid. Instead, he had to wait for the jeans to be shipped to the stores. Until then, he couldn't get his share. This obviously disappointed Jeff. He had badly needed the money to support his family. But he wasn't going to just sit around and wait for payment. In the meantime, he was going to look for more opportunities to get paid. By selling those jeans, Jeff had built connections with stores all over downtown and decided to call them and ask if they needed help with wholesale. To his surprise, they all had some type of work they needed help with. Little by little, Jeff and his friends started middlemanning side jobs and becoming a wholesaler for all these random stores in LA. And for the first time since being in America, he began making really good money by simply bridging connections. So much money, in fact, that by the end of 1981, after just one year of living in America, Jeff took $260,000 in cash, stuffed it in duffel bags, and bought his first house, moving his family to the hills of Encino, California. Jeff Hamilton was now 25 years old, illegally living in California, and making a ton of money. With no bank account, every job he took had to be paid in cold, hard cash. And just as his cash flow started to increase, Jeff decided to get himself and his partner an office in downtown Los Angeles, right in the fashion district. Although it wasn't much, this 400 square foot place was perfect for their operation. It gave them enough space to each have a desk, make phone calls, and plot their next move. By now, Jeff was turning over so much clothes that he no longer cared about the quality of them. If they were fake, they were fake. Money was money, and he eagerly wanted more of it. But as Jeff became more hungry for success, his partner became lazy. 
He was no longer at the office at 8 a.m. when Jeff was. Instead, he was strolling in at noon. And when Jeff wanted to develop their own polo alternative brand called Golf, his partner didn't show any interest. With the fading work ethic, they were no longer seeing eye to eye and that irritated Jeff. One day, Jeff had enough and was forced to give his partner an ultimatum. You either buy me out of this business or I buy you out, Jeff said. Here's $10,000, take it or leave it. His friend was upset. A year ago, he had brought Jeff in to help him with wholesale distribution and now he was being forced out of his own company. Reluctantly, the guy agreed. He had saved up a pretty good amount of money and this extra 10,000 would help him reestablish himself. So just like that, he left their 400 square foot office and never looked back. Jeff now owned 100% of their wholesale company. But to Jeff's surprise, he couldn't handle the business alone and just two months after buying out his partner, the company collapsed. He was still trying to make it work, but every deal was falling through. One day, while Jeff was coming into the building, he stepped into an elevator with someone who owned an office a few floors above his. After a little bit of small talk, Jeff recognized he had an accent and asked the guy for his name and where he was from. George Marciano, the guy replied. I'm from France. Like Jeff, George had just moved from France to America and with that in common, they became friends almost instantly. Funny enough, George's brother Maurice was also moving to America and had kids the exact same age as Jeff's. Maurice was already successful in France, where he ran multiple retail locations, so moving to Los Angeles was easy for him. Before Jeff knew it, Maurice's kids were attending the same school as his own. Even their wives had become friends. Jeff now found himself spending five out of six days a week hanging out with George and Maurice Marciano. Amongst small talk, they would also share ideas with each other and one day George asked for Jeff's advice. Since Jeff was friends with almost every store in LA, he wanted his opinion on a new t-shirt brand that he was in the process of creating. Unlike other t-shirt brands at the time, these were a woman's line of white t-shirts only. To Jeff, the shirts looked elegant. The quality was unlike anything else on the market. But after a few months of product testing, George eventually ditched the line altogether. Maurice, his brother, had pitched him a better idea. How about instead of making women's t-shirts, we make the highest quality women's jeans, he said. George agreed and together in 1981, he and Maurice started a small brand called Guess. They had initially wanted Jeff to be a part of their company and run the menswear line, but Jeff wasn't interested in working for anyone. The last time he worked with someone, their business imploded and he wasn't going to make that mistake again. But watching his two best friends become successful right in front of his eyes ate Jeff alive. Guess had just done two million a year in sales and he was barely making any money on his own. So one day, Jeff decided to pitch them an idea. He offered to help them expand their business into menswear without having to work directly for them. Instead, he wanted exclusive access to their guest jeans for men's license. Despite having no experience in fabric or pattern making, Jeff said he would design, market, and sell the jeans himself, breaking off the parent company a percentage from each sale. They wouldn't have to do anything. Jeff would handle it. All George and Maurice had to do was sit back and let Jeff do his thing. But to Jeff's surprise, the brothers declined his offer. Instead, they wanted to bring him on and pay him a salary of $2,000 a week. Jeff countered, I got $22,000 in capital ready to go. You guys can keep 100% of the guest brand, just let me have the license for the men's line. Eventually, they agreed, and at the end of 1982, a 26-year-old Jeff Hamilton became the founder and creative director of Guest Jeans for Men. Having no experience in designing clothes, Jeff had no idea where to start. He called banks, lied to them, said he had $80,000 in cash, and got new lines of credit. Learning from his first failed business, he knew that he would need help. The guy who operated the elevator at his office building told him that he could make samples, so Jeff just hired him on the spot. Together, they officially started working on January 15th, and by March, Jeff had found a buyer for their first collection. Saks Fifth had agreed to buy 24 pieces of their new guest jeans for men's line. But one sale wasn't enough. They needed more than that, and being a master hustler himself, Jeff cooked up a plan. The exact same day that Saks put his products on the floor, Jeff and all of his buddies went to the store, undercover, and bought everything back. Although they left bigger and smaller sizes available to make it seem more realistic, for the most part, his 24-piece collection was sold out. That next day, he was jolted awake as his cell phone rang. It was 7 a.m. and the buyer for Saks Fifth was on the other line. He was ecstatic. He told Jeff that Guest Jeans for Men was an overnight success and that Saks Fifth now wanted to stock his collection in 15 other stores. Although he didn't have any more products, Jeff lied and told the guy sorry, but Bloomingdale's already called and bought the rest of the stock. The buyer panicked, playing right into Jeff's hand, and countered with an offer to buy not just 24 pieces, but 1,200 pieces in total. And forget the 15 store offer. The guy told Jeff that if he canceled the deal with their competitor, Bloomingdale's, that they would put guest jeans for men in every Saks Fifth store across the country. Jeff took the offer and a month later, in April, after getting his products in every Saks Fifth store, Guest Jeans for Men did $17,000 in sales. 
From there, Guest Jeans for Men exploded. By August of 1983, just eight months after starting the brand, Jeff Hamilton's Guest Jeans for Men's line was now doing $100,000 a month in sales. By January of 1984, it was doing $600,000 a month, and by January of 1985, it was doing $5 million a month in sales. And by the end of that year, Guest Jeans for Men was averaging a cool $75 million a month in sales. Between the ages of 27 and 29, Jeff Hamilton was making so much money that he was writing himself personal payroll checks of $43,000 on a weekly basis. He was on top of the world, living life and buying brand new Rolls Royces for retail. With Jeff's help, Guest was doing so well that the rest of the Marciano brothers came to America to help out, but they quickly challenged for ownership. George, who owned 65% of Guest when he started, now only owned 40%. And with this new split in ownership, Jeff was now earning more than any of the Marciano brothers since he still owned 100% of the license he was given. Because he owned 100%, Jeff was bringing home $6 million a year, even after giving them their cut of $2.1 million in royalties. Jeff's Guest Jeans for Men's line was making more than the entire Guest brand itself, and that soured them. They regretted giving him the license in the first place and began fighting for it back. Since all of Jeff's designs needed to be approved by the parent company before going into production, they used this to leverage influence over Jeff and stopped approving any of his new designs. Since they were no longer on speaking terms and he was unable to produce new products, Jeff began filing lawsuits against them. During this time, Jeff began spending an upwards of $200,000 a month on attorneys. After a lengthy legal battle, Jeff and the Marcianos agreed to go their separate ways, and after finishing out his contract, Jeff was no longer a part of Guess. This crippled him. Although he made good money from Guess Jeans for Men, Jeff no longer had a source of income, and after spending $3 million in lawyer fees, he was going broke for the second time in his life. His overhead was outrageous. He couldn't keep up with the lavish lifestyle of buying houses, properties, and cars, and his 50,000 square foot warehouse with 200 employees had to be closed. He fired everyone. It was now just Jeff Hamilton, all by himself, yet again. After his lawsuit with Guess ended, Jeff needed a new business and in 1986, at 30 years old, decided to launch his own brand of lifestyle clothing. Since his Guest account was under the name Jeff Hamilton Inc. DBA Guest for Men, Jeff decided to trademark his own name and use it for his own brand. It was a name everyone was now familiar with, and despite the lawsuit, his name still held value within the fashion community. But this time, he wasn't going to be selling jeans. He wanted to try something new. As he was searching for a new direction to take, he began reminiscing about his first visit to America and an image popped up in his head. It was that varsity jacket with the big block letters from UCLA. Snapping back to reality, Jeff went to his closet and looked at a selection of leather jackets. They all sucked. The next day, Jeff drove to his friend Billy Idol's house and he and Billy went on one of their many weekly Harley Davidson rides. It was during this ride where Jeff noticed that not even Billy Idol had a cool jacket to wear. He even went to the shops on Rodeo and even they didn't have any cool leather jackets. Jeff was determined to change that and decided the new brand he was starting under his own Jeff Hamilton name was going to make the coolest leather jackets around, ones that even rock stars would want to wear. Going home, Jeff reached in his closet and pulled out two of his favorite leather jackets. Walking to the counter, Jeff grabbed a pair of scissors and started cutting and sewing different parts of the leather together, creating something entirely new out of each of them. When he showed it to his friends, everybody liked them. He put zippers where zippers weren't supposed to be, flaps in unique places, and completely changed the way people looked at jackets. At the time, he was already spending $100,000 a month marketing his Jeff Hamilton brand, and as people began seeing him and his friends in their new leather jackets, word got around, and before Jeff knew it, everybody wanted their own custom jacket. Not having the means or resources to mass produce them, Jeff began making all of his custom one-of-a-kind leather jackets by hand. With the help of Billy Idol and Whitesnake, hype around his early jackets rose and stores began purchasing and stocking his products. One day, while he was watching TV, Jeff grabbed the remote, turned the channel, and an MTV music video caught his attention. They were showing a video for Madonna's Borderline, one of the biggest songs at the time, and as the scene changed, Jeff's mouth dropped. Madonna was wearing one of his leather jackets. But she wasn't just wearing it, she was wearing it in her first music video ever. And with that, Jeff, for the first time in his life, became a part of pop culture history. After his jacket appeared in Madonna's music video, the Jeff Hamilton brand started to rise in popularity. He even convinced George Michael to wear one of his jackets in a video. And as the brand grew and started to make more money, Jeff, on a whim, purchased a $2 million home in Beverly Hills, despite the fact he couldn't afford to live in it. But instead of foreclosing on the home, Jeff listed it for rent, and one of the first applications he got was from Jermaine Jackson, the brother of Michael Jackson. In renting his home to Jermaine, Jeff developed a friendship with the Jackson family and began creating jackets for them. When hanging out with the Jacksons, Jeff became entwined in celebrity culture and found himself in the same circle with some of the biggest basketball players at the time. 
It was in these social groups that Jeff met one of his first clients in the NBA, Reggie Theus, a guard who played for the Sacramento Kings. Little did he know, making a jacket for Reggie would soon open doors for Jeff to meet some of the most iconic sports stars ever. A few weeks after delivering his jacket to Reggie, Reggie called Jeff back and thanked him profusely. Not only was it unlike anything he had seen before, every time he wore it, he always got compliments. Fellow teammates and other players in the league were expressing interest and he told Jeff he had someone he needed him to meet. His friend who played point guard for the Los Angeles Lakers kept asking him for a jacket and one evening, while at a party together, Reggie introduced Jeff to Magic Johnson. After meeting Magic, everything changed. Not only was Magic a great basketball player, he was a master at networking and friends with some of the most influential people in the world. In fact, it was Magic himself who first introduced Jeff to one of his closest friends, Michael Jordan. Meeting Michael meant the world to Jeff. He had grown up idolizing the American dream and Michael Jordan was the epitome of it. Over the next few months, Michael and Jeff became good friends and in 1996, Jeff created his first jacket for Michael Jordan. The day after giving him the jacket, Jeff's phone started ringing like crazy. Michael Jordan had worn it on national television and now everybody wanted one. Leveraging his popularity, Jeff called up the NBA and asked them if he could use their logos to make jackets for more players. With legends in the league already supporting him, the NBA agreed to give Jeff a long-standing licensing deal that allowed him to use their team logos, names, and mascots in his work. They even commissioned him to design jackets for the winners of the 1996-1997 All-Star Game. From there, Jeff started going even crazier with the designs. He was sick of basic concepts and wanted to do something different. Using his NBA license, Jeff started to get more flashy and began putting team logos all over his jackets. The idea was to create pieces that not only NBA players would love, but fans as well. From there, Jeff started the tradition of giving his favorite players jackets after winning the NBA's final games and these became known as his championship jackets. While teams were doing their on-court celebrations, Jeff was in the locker room waiting to give them their jackets. When the players got there, the press followed and his jackets were seen in pictures all over mainstream media. These jackets had become somewhat of a symbol for these players and were often more idolized than the championship ring itself. The ring would take months to ship and you couldn't show it off right away, but your Jeff Hamilton jacket was there and ready to go. Players started wearing them as a badge of honor. And as the story goes, in 1998, when the Chicago Bulls beat the Utah Jazz and secured the championship, Michael Jordan put the champagne showers and cigar smoking on hold, waiting for Jeff Hamilton to give him his jacket. Gaining precedent over the journalists and sponsors crowded around the locker room, Jeff walked right up to Michael Jordan and handed him his celebratory jacket. As sports broadcaster Stuart Scott watched it happen, he immediately knew he needed to have an interview with Jeff Hamilton. He was highly regarded by Michael Jordan and clearly an important designer. Tapping Jeff on the shoulder, Stuart Scott introduced himself and told him that they were going live in five minutes and that he wanted to do an on-air interview. Jeff politely declined. He was living in the moment, celebrating with the players and didn't have time for an interview. Stuart Scott didn't let him off that easy and instead gave him an ultimatum. You either party and nothing happens, or you come with me and talk about your jackets in front of 60 million people watching us right now. Jeff reluctantly agreed and did the interview. And good thing he did, because within that next month, Jeff sold over 2,000 Bulls championship jackets. From then on, Jeff Hamilton made NBA championship jackets for every title that followed, not just the ones that his favorite players were in. Although basketball is at the core of American culture, it wasn't the only sport that Jeff had in sight. Instead, he wanted to do jackets for every major sports industry, and that's exactly what he did. While still holding his NBA license, Jeff called the NFL, NBA, NHL, and MLB, getting exclusive rights to use their logos as well. Even Disney and Warner Brothers gave him a licensing deal. Jeff Hamilton now held licenses that covered every part of culture and his jackets were exploding in popularity. Everyone from celebrities to inner city kids from Brooklyn, Detroit, and Chicago wanted a jacket. At the height of his career, Jeff was making jackets for some of the biggest stars such as Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, Biggie Smalls, P. Diddy, Gucci Mane, Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, Bill Clinton, the King of Morocco, Nelson Mandela, and many more. He even began making cheaper versions that he could sell in retail stores which ultimately helped him make $25 million a year in sales. But sadly, as his career skyrocketed, his personal relationships perished. He was rarely home and his wife of 38 years was filing for a divorce. In order to save his personal assets, Jeff spent an upwards of $7 million in attorney fees. The divorce ultimately burnt him out and ruined his relationship with his kids. Now, down on his luck, Jeff was miserable. His legal troubles were costing him too much money and in order to support himself, he began taking money from his company. But this angered his investors. He was costing the brand too much money and he was too big of a public star for them to manage. They wanted him separated from the company and in 2002, Jeff sold the Jeff Hamilton brand and went on a hiatus. 
He was now 46 years old and quote unquote retired. For the next few years, Jeff got involved with art and other ventures, but nothing was successful. He could no longer afford the mortgage on his house and all he could think about was the fact that he was once again going broke. He was in his thoughts and the negativity kept him up at night. In order to deal with the pain and stress of his collapsing career, Jeff turned to weed and alcohol. Although it helped him forget about how bad his life was getting, in 2019, things took a turn for the worse. He had fallen out of the limelight and felt he no longer had a reason to wake up in the morning. He was now taking Xanax and combining it with drinking and smoking, he no longer had the energy to work. Whenever he drove his car, he was unable to keep his eyes on the road and he got in hundreds of fender benders. He was costing himself so much money that he had to sell his house. And as if things couldn't get any worse, in December of 2019, Jeff got in a horrific car crash that nearly cost him his life. After losing control of his car, Jeff woke up in the hospital with a broken arm and fractured chest. For the next five days, he stayed in the critical care unit where doctors worked to save his life. But just as his life was taking a turn for the worse, he got a call from Jim Jones who said he was going to make a song called Jeff Hamilton. Jim and Jeff had been on good terms since the diplomat days, so Jeff gave him the go ahead and let him use his name in the song. After that, in early 2020, Jeff got a random DM from somebody named ASAP Rocky. At the time, Jeff had no idea who ASAP Rocky was. He had seen his name a few times in the news but wasn't sure why he was so popular. Rocky said he was a big fan of Jeff's work and that he loved what he had done with athletes, dipset, and more. Rocky reminisced on his time growing up in Harlem and told Jeff that his jackets were a big part of the culture out there. He wanted Jeff to bring his brand back and asked him if he was free to grab lunch in Beverly Hills. Jeff agreed and the next day ASAP Rocky and Jeff Hamilton met for the first time. During lunch, Rocky asked Jeff if he could make him a jacket for Yams Day, but it was on too short of a notice and Jeff respectfully declined. Instead, Jeff offered to loan Rocky an old Kobe Bryant jacket from his personal collection, which Rocky gladly accepted. But instead of mailing it to him, Rocky wanted Jeff to bring the jacket to him at the concert, but Jeff couldn't do that. He had just gone through hell and he was too broke to travel. But to his surprise, ASAP Rocky insisted on him going to Yams Day and purchased Jeff a first class ticket to Brooklyn. Upon arriving at the airport, Jeff was picked up in a limousine accompanied by ASAP Rocky and together they went to the Barclays Center to celebrate the life and legacy of ASAP Yams. The following day, Virgil Abloh posted a photo of ASAP Rocky wearing Jeff's Kobe Bryant jacket and overnight, Jeff's popularity and career began turning around. The new generation was finding out who he was and his Instagram was blowing up. In order to continue his rise back into the limelight, Jeff cooked up a plan. He had no money, but he had tons of resources. Looking in his closet, Jeff grabbed the last 10 jackets he had and reached out to all the popular rappers at the time, like Davies, Chance the Rapper, and Jim Jones. He told them that he wanted to loan them his jacket so they could wear him to the Chicago All-Star Game later that year. They all agreed and when the press released photos of the event, the biggest celebrities in the world were pictured wearing Jeff Hamilton jackets. After that, Jeff started getting calls from big companies looking to collaborate with him. One of the first was Converse, who wanted to do a shoe collaboration with him in Chinatown Market, which Jeff gladly accepted. But just as he was regaining momentum, COVID shut everything down. Although the pandemic made it difficult for him to produce jackets, it helped him in ways he could have never imagined. Netflix was gearing up for the release of The Last Dance, a film that chronicled Michael Jordan's career, and since Jeff Hamilton was at every single finals game that Michael Jordan ever played in, his jackets were seen throughout most of the footage. Upon release of the film, Jeff Hamilton jackets were seen by over 23.8 million people around the globe. This reignited hype around Jeff's name. And in July of 2020, when the NBA went into the bubble, Jeff picked up the phone and called them with a plan in mind. He wanted to make that year's championship jacket, and since he had a 30 plus year relationship with the NBA, they agreed to give him a new licensing agreement. Instead of selling one of one jackets, Jeff cooked up a collection that could be enjoyed by the masses with several different price points, and within the first month of his website being open, he made half a million dollars in sales. This allowed him to basically go back into business overnight and put the Jeff Hamilton brand back on the map. Since then, Jeff has been working nonstop. Alongside his partnership with Mitchell and Ness, Jeff juggles numerous collaborations, sometimes taking on 15 or more at a time. As far as creating his jackets, Jeff still makes everything manually by himself without using any machines. All of the logos are handmade using small X-Acto knives and every little detail is cut, glued, and sewn on by hand. This handmade process currently takes him about 60 days to make one jacket. Although tedious, Jeff treats his products like art and captures every detail perfectly. He even personally signs and dates the jackets to ensure the long-term value and authenticity of his products. Unlike earlier in his career, Jeff is now very selective when it comes to selling his clothing in stores and is focused on maintaining full control of his products. As far as the future of Jeff Hamilton the brand, Jeff wants to focus his efforts on collabs and capsule collections and less on gimmicky licensing deals. To him, success isn't about having a lot of money in the bank. It's about waking up happy, having a purpose, and being excited to work. 
because more than money, passion and legacy is what he wants to leave behind. Those are the things that matter most. With each new day, Jeff is focused on maximizing his potential and doing everything he can while he is still around. At 67 years old, Jeff is living out his American dream, lavishly in Beverly Hills, California, and focused more than ever on his comeback story. As far as his legacy, Jeff is doing everything he can to ensure his name stays relevant long after he's gone. Because to him, legacy is planting flowers into a field without having any expectations to ever see the flowers fully bloom. And with that, I conclude the unboxing of Jeff Hamilton.